All right. Lovely to see you all here today. Sorry I couldn't be here a couple of weeks ago, but that's uh, life. We're here today. And uh, so it's good to be able to share with you today. And um, what I'd like to be able to share with this uh, is <clears throat> what are our roots feeding on? Every one of us here today are sinking roots deep down into something. There are eight billion people in this world and there are eight billion trees that are sinking roots into something. What are you sinking your roots into? Anyway, there was this lady who um, uh, April last year won the record in Britain for the uh, lotto for 193 million euro. Not bad, not bad. What would you do? What would you do? And of course the saying here is, wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice? And the, the numbers that um, uh, one was 6, 27, uh, 29, 40, 41, 2 and 12. And they got them there, 193 million. A record for Euro Lotto. But of course, all records get broken, don't they? And earlier this year, another family had won their Lotto of $205 million. The exchange rate is 1.64, so that translates to around about 300 million Australian dollars. Staggering, isn't it? So, just walk through for a moment with me, with them with their lotto ticket. And as those balls go in that great big drum, number one comes out and the next ball comes out. This is looking good, dear. And the next one, next one. And I think, I don't know how it all works, but have you got to get the next two numbers in order to get the whole jackpot? Is that how it works? Good answer. <laughs> I was testing you, brother. <laughs> Dick, rightio. All right, so I don't know how it works either, but I think you've got to. Anyway, so by the time they got to their last two numbers, dear, we have just won 205. Could, could you imagine the excitement and the joy? So Monday morning, 8 a.m., what are they going to be doing? Going down to the local news agent there, I'm going to assume this is how they work. Here's our ticket. Slotting it down there. Ah, yes, madam, they are the correct numbers. Congratulations. Chung chung. Oh, there appears to be a problem. What could be the problem? They're the right numbers, are they not? Yes, madam, they are the right numbers. However, there was no automatic deduction last Thursday out of your account to purchase the ticket. Oh, because each week they had an automatic payment to pay for their lotto ticket. And due to insufficient funds in the account, your ticket was not purchased last week. Awfully sorry, madam. Do have a nice day. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah. When I read this, if I was connected to a monitor, my heart pressure would have gone through the roof. <laughs> I was just, oh no. Could you just cringe at that? Could you feel the bit of pain for them that, you know, that they didn't have eight quid in their account to pay for it? And could you imagine, I thought that you put the money in. Who took the money out? And then the blame game would start, missing out on 205 million euros. But resilient people as they are, they did say to themselves, 
we will redouble our efforts. We will ensure there is enough money in the account each week, and now they'll choose different numbers for next time. Oh, okay. So what are they sinking their roots down into? What are they seeking their trust in? What are we seeking our trust in? Now, we live in an incredibly fractured world today that people are increasingly concerned of the fracturing of society. And this fracturing of society is causing and an awful lot of uncertainty, insecurity, and so people are looking for roots to sink their life down into. Take for instance, and uh, if Ben Ashby was here, I'll give him credit for this because he sent me a, a YouTube clip of Richard Dawkins, the greatest evangelist for atheism. Uh, you know Richard Dawkins. And he was bemoaning the fact that Britain is no longer the country that he was used to and that he likes, enjoys, and desires to live in. And he was bemoaning that there is no longer the Christian ethos within Britain. Atheist wanting a Christian ethos. Mm. And in that interview, he says... You know, okay, so you want the Christian ethos, and the oh, oh yes, of, of course I do, yes. We've got to have the Christian ethos. It, it, it creates that certainty and that security. And the question was asked, do you believe in the resurrection? Oh, no, goodness me, no, of course not. So you want the Christian ethos, security, but not be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Mm. Sorry, doesn't quite work like that. Now, the fracturing of our society is causing, as I said, considerable disconsternation amongst all sectors of society and all levels of political class, and everyone's trying to find a solution. Anyway. There was an interesting article in The Australian uh, last month, and Paul Kelly was quoting a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Haidt, who's the professor of ethical leadership at the New York University Stern School of Business. And he did some research amongst uh, younger people, and, and his chilling thesis is this, is that the childhood has become transformed by what? A small group of tech companies. For the first time in human history, an entire cohort of Gen Z born after 1995 has become the collective subject for a global social experiment on a new way of growing up. It was triggered by the embrace of the smartphone, which hate says has changed life for everyone after its uh, introduction. Okay, all right, so smartphone, internet, big tech companies, nothing that we don't know, correct? Right, all right. So he says the consequences of this are that a very large upturn in major dep depressive episodes because of social media. Uh, people have become more anxious, depressed, self-harming, and suicidal. Suicide has actually gone up quite a lot because of social media. It is as though we've sent Gen Z to grow up on Mars in the largest uncontrolled experiment humanity has ever performed on its own children. Large increases in, in mental health, Hospitalisation from 210 to 215 with 81% increase in girls, 51% for boys. And we have presided over, what does that last part say? The, the rewiring of our children. As parents, grandparents, we need to be alarmed. We need to be alarmed. 
This bloke isn't an Adventist. He's not a Christian. But he can see what is happening, and this is contributing to the fracturing of the family, of society, and the glue that holds our world together. Now, big tech companies has the unique ability to be able to shape an adolescent's mental, mental models of acceptable behaviour in a matter of... Hmm, that's what his research says. In the matter of hours. Contrast this with parents. Whereas parents can struggle unsuccessfully, unsuccessfully for... And we know that as parents, don't we? How much we have battled with our adolescents and trying to beat them, oh, not beat them, um, <clears throat> to shape them. For years, to get their children to sit up straight or stop whining, parents don't get to use the power of conformity bias, so they are often no match for the socialising power of social media. Parents, we need to be alarmed at the power of social media to formulate and to shape. Where are people sinking their roots? What are they sinking their roots into? What are we sinking our roots into? And girls are more vulnerable because they are subjected to hundreds of times more social comparisons uh, than girls, or boys rather, are subjected to hundreds of times more social comparisons than girls have experienced for nearly all of human evolution, including more cruelty, more bullying, because social media platforms, what? Incentivize, facilitate. And how often are we hearing about bullying online? How often? And is it taken down? Yet, if you advertise a health program, you get blocked or shut down on Facebook, don't you? <laughs> Odd, isn't it? Yet, when it comes to bullying online, that's all okay. It's all right on from one side of, you know, without sort of going into the, this too much, but bullying seems to be all okay online. And when you have it ramped up and, and incentivized and it sort of ramped up to the, degree, to the degree that it is that it causes depression, anxiety, it paralyzes people. And so it's actually quite dangerous and the results are alarming. Social media platforms are therefore the most efficient conformity engines ever invented, hate has said. Incredible, isn't it? They can shape an adolescent's mental models of acceptable behaviour in a matter of hours where parents can struggle unsuccessfully for years. All right. Anna Lemke said this, the smartphone is a modern-day hypodermic needle delivering digital dopamine. That's pretty strong stuff, isn't it? Now, who is addicted to the internet? No one. Do you want to find out if you are or not? Turn it off. See how long you last. Turn it off. I tried. The smartphone is the modern day hypodermic needle delivering digital dopamine 24-7 for a wide generation. Sherry Tuckle observes that the consequences that we are forever elsewhere. You know what it's like when you go to an airport and you see a family, they're looking forward to going to Disneyland. What are they all doing? They're all in four corners. Doom scrolling. Yeah, connecting. We're forever elsewhere. But here's the kicker. As we're sitting here today, and I'm sharing this with you, 
and we're part of the big tech world. We live in it. We're immersed in it. We're in that little pond of warm water with that little goldfish there. And what do we say to ourselves? I'm okay. It doesn't affect me. I can handle it. What are we sinking our roots down into? What are we taking in to our minds? We have to be careful about this because at the end of the day, every heart, eight billion of them, are nurturing deep devotional acts of spiritual faith with eternal consequences. And you don't have to be an Adventist to have a faith. You don't have to be a Christian to have a faith or a Buddha, Buddha Buddhist, Baha'i to have a faith. You don't have to. You can be an atheist and have a faith. Everybody has something. And everybody is looking for significance, meaning, and purpose in life. People are looking for approval. One quarter of people spend their entire life looking for approval and will do anything for it. And so consequently, all that they do and that drives them for approval is for that. Yes, people might have a belief that is tagged on, but people are always looking for something. And so people pursue a deep faith in something. Eight billion people. Anyway, Jonathan Haidt concludes. He calls social media a fountain of bedevilments. It trains people to think exactly contrary to the world's religious and spiritual traditions. The message is, think about yourself first. Be materialistic, judgmental, boastful, petty. Seek glory as quantified by likes and followers. There can be little dispute about this conclusion from a religious perspective. Social media is a disease of the mind. Yet everyone, 8 billion people, are making high stakes decisions about spiritual commitments, who God is and who he's not, that has eternal consequences. And so these are forces that are working against us and that we need to be aware of and that we need to set a bulwark against. Social media is dangerous. But what is even more dangerous is the alcoholic saying, I can handle it. I am okay. And that was the problem in Jeremiah chapter 17. You see, in Je Jeremiah chapter 17, and we'll turn to that, in Jeremiah 17, there was a problem in Jeremiah. His world was also a fractured world as well. We would think back then there was one cohesive narrative that bounded society together, but that was far from the case. Society had fractured uh, to the point that we read in uh, verse 1. And um, the problem with what Judah was doing Excuse me. Um, in, in, in chapter 1, the sin of Judah, verse, chapter 17, verse 1, the sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, with a point of a diamond. It is engraved on the tablet of their heart. Okay, so now Jeremiah is talking about their heart. He's talking about the sin of Judah. What was the sin of Judah? Well, fortunately, it is their world, it's not our world. And so we can talk about their world with a fair bit of safety and think, ah, oh, I'm glad that this does not apply to me because they worshipped, you know, the, the, the fertility cults, the Asherah poles and all that sort of thing and just go, ah, oh, well, you know, isn't that wonderful? That's not my world. I don't do fertility cults and all that sort of thing. However, there are some things that may cross over here that I want us to, to, to be aware of. And so 
he, he writes here that the, the, the sin of Judah was, you'll recall that the sin of Judah, or that the Judeans were worshippers of the true God. But they walked back from that and they started to worship the fer fertility cults and they got a lot of joy and a lot of pleasure out of that. Now, how did it go from that to that? How did it go from the real worship of the true God to that? Because, you know, you, you're talking about pretty gross practices here that I won't go into. How did it go from that to that? Was it, did it just happen overnight? You see, because when they were part of the fertility cults, they would be thinking, well, you know, we're going to be enjoying eternal life soon, aren't we? If we worship the gods in this way, we will appease the gods and we will enjoy eternal life. That would be a fair assumption, would it not? They would not be going, turning up to the, uh, the, the, these cults and going, oh, this is shocking. I'm going to lose my eternal life here and just carry on worship. Would it work like that? I, I, I don't think so. I think they actually genuinely believed that they were doing the right thing. But how do they go from the real worship of God to that? Because they thought, I am okay. And the problem was that the, the sin of Judah was engraved on their hearts on stone and with a diamond. There was that permanency about it. They were so determined, that permanency of it, they were so determined to, uh, to share and to pass on that faith and that belief system to the subsequent generations. And this went to the very heart and the very core of, um, of the Judean belief. Because it goes on here, on the, um, the sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, with a point of a diamond. It is engraved on the tablet of their heart and on the horns of their altars, while their children remember, remember their altars and their ashram, and beside every green tree and every high hill. And so it talks about the, the horns of the altars, and you will recall that the horns of the altars. Uh, in, the, in this situation, is the echoes of the sanctuary. That's where the forgiveness was come. That's where a person would receive grace from God. But all this was turned upside down with their, their false worship. Now, what was the problem here? What went wrong? Well, Jeremiah, we just pick up the story again, and we'll just go back to, uh, go to verse 4. You shall loosen your hand from your heritage that I gave you, and I'll make you serve your enemies in a land that you do not know. And so because of their sin, God is going to punish them. Verse 5, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert, and he shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness and in the uninhabited lands. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Now, two groups. So you've got one group here. It's cursed is the man who trusts in who? In a man. Who trusts in another person. All right? Second group. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by the water and sends its roots by the stream and does not bear when he comes. For it leaves, remains green, and is not anxious in the year of drought, for he does not uh, cease to bear fruit. So he bears fruit in good times, bad times, and drought, and rain, and in the rainy season. Two groups of people here. What is striking about this these two groups is here, all of them trust in something. All right? One of them trusts in man, the other trusts in God. Eight billion people are making decisions about their 
faith. They are trusting in something. Eight billion people are sinking roots down into something and to seek meaning out of life. And so you've got two groups of people here who trust, one trusts in man, the other trusts in God. Now, when we go to the problem here with that the, 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 the trees that sink roots down into the, into the water, trees, when, when it comes to plants, they really don't care where they get their nutrients from, do they? They're going to suck into something, aren't they? As long as they get something, those roots will go down. When it comes to the shrub here that is in the desert, it just wants a bit of water, doesn't it? It wants a bit of water. And so when a desert has the occasional rainy season, this shrub will sink its roots down, but they're shallow roots. And when the drought comes, that shrub will eventually just dry, wither, it's tangled, it's messy, the leaves fall off, and it becomes, you know, like in those old Western movies, the old tumbleweed. And, uh, and just sort of blows through and it's nothing more. And so here we got the picture of the roots sinking down into something. The shrub that's in the desert that is thirsty, sinking its roots down into something to try and get some moisture, but it eventually withers and it dies um, in, the, in the uninhabited land. Now, the cure is here when we come down to um, the, the issue that Jeremiah highlights here is that the heart is deceitful above all things. See, the problem here with the two groups of people here, one group trusts the Lord, the other one trusts in man. The one who trusts in man says that I am okay. I am doing well, thank you. My beliefs are perfectly fine. But yet the other group depends on the Lord. Jeremiah cuts to the chase here and says that the heart is deceitful above all things, which means that we all have the wrong heart, the wrong attitude, and we are not capable of formulating by ourselves, right beliefs, right attitudes. Are you with me? We are not capable of formulating right beliefs, right attitudes apart from God. But we often think that we're okay. Can I give you a wee bit of an illustration here? Now, Anyone like going to a silver service at a restaurant? I remember I went to one about 1980, was a long time ago. But when you go to a nice fancy restaurant, you get everything all dished up to you, silver service, don't you? Everything's all set out properly. Right, now, if you were to go to a fancy restaurant, they'll, of course, give you a nice tablecloth. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> beggars can't be choosers, can they? All right. Now, with any fancy restaurant, you've got to have the right cutlery. It's not Kmart stuff. Royal Dalton, that'll do. All right. And, of course, you've got to have a nice glass, and any good waiter will go... Ooh. All right. OK. All right. So, anyway... Now, does anyone know what the, where the side plate goes? To the left or to the right? 
Correct. You have been. And I thought you were raised at Macca's. All right. Okay. Now, oh, this is hard work. All right. Now, when knives and forks. Does anyone know how the knives and forks things go? Come on, all you heathens here. Where's your etiquette? All right. So, we're going to have first course would be soup. So, we'll just put this plate on here for now. All right, so where does the soup spoon go, right or to the left? Depends what picture you look at on the internet. But we'll put it on the right just for your sake. All right, knife and fork. No, it's actually the left, actually. It should be the left. It should be the left. All right. Well, it, it, it does, but for the sake of the illustration, we'll just go with the knife and fork. And, uh, all right, okay, so do you use the knife and fork for soup? No. No. All right. Now, these are your dessert implements, and they go to the top. All right. Now, there's something wrong here. Oh, whoops. Sorry. And, of course, we need the serviette. Hmm. Got to flatten that out a little bit. All right. So. Ring that looks all right. <laughs> okay. Now, there is a mistake here. This knife should be facing inwards. My apologies about that. But anyway, all right, so in my 20s, I wanted my life nicely all laid out. Dessert up here, knife and fork, soup, plate. I wanted my life laid out perfectly. In 20s, I had it all laid out. It'll be just, ch -ch -ch -ch, yep. 28, I'll be doing this. 35, I'll be this. 40, I'll be here. I would have done this, would have done... You know what I'm saying? I had it all mapped out. You know what happens in life when it's all nicely mapped out? Oh. Turn the camera off. <laughs> Sorry, Debs. <sighs> <laughs> oh well, all right. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> it does. <sighs> Sorry, madam. <laughs> anyway, so we we tend to reset it how I want it. Yeah, we might have a few broken pieces, but yet there's something else of what we also do in life. As we go through life and we start looking at some spiritual questions of who God is, what he is like, we, we start to then formulate some ideas. Like I often hear, you know, if we were to say that this, you know, the, the plates and these knives and forks represent our life and, and, the, and it sits on the tablecloth and, and God, you know, um, represents this tablecloth and we have some ideas about uh, who God is. I am a spiritual person. I don't go to church. And so we make theological assumptions about God. And so I don't like this tablecloth. And so with me being a spiritual person... I believe in God. Yes, of course I do. You know, he, he's around here. And, but I don't go to church. You know, I'm not really into all this sort of thing. You know, church is, you know, too many hypocrites at church. And so in making that assumption about I am a spiritual person, I am making a theological statement about who God is. 
I am making a theological statement about who God is because God then fits into my version of what spirituality actually is. And when I first became into the church, oh, people say, I'm not really into this doctrine stuff. You know, all this doctrine stuff, it's all far too complicated. You know, when they talk about judgment and talk about oh, this thousand years business, it's all, we don't know if it's a thousand years or it's 10,000 years or it's all just symbolic, you know. And, and oh, that's making a theological statement as well. And of course, then you might hear something else about, well, <clears throat> you know what? I'm a pretty good person. I've been a deacon for 20 years. And because I have been a deacon for 20 years, God owes me. And that's a theological statement as well. Because God owes me, he's going to give me life and he's going to reward me for all the good things that I have done. Isn't that nice? And I love it when God rewards me because the Pharisees, they were awfully good people. And as they do good things, God owes them. And as I do good things, and I've been an elder for 25 years, God owes me, and therefore no bad things will happen, and my life is going to be pretty good, which is also a theological statement as well. We all make theological assumptions about who God is. And that is awfully dangerous because now I've cut this tablecloth down to the size of what fits for me. And I don't care whether you're on the right, the left, CB, liberal, conservative, we all do it. We all cut God down to the size of Mark's own mind. And we all think, well, God is like this. I think God is a bit bigger than this. God is much bigger than that. He's much bigger than us. What we need to be able to do is to be able to follow God regardless of the cost. We trust in something. Man sometimes trusts in man. Sometimes man trusts in God according to Jeremiah. But according to Jeremiah, we are incapable by ourselves of formulating right attitudes and behaviours apart from God. Are you with me? Is that a fair assumption? Because it says here, verse 10, I, the Lord, search all hearts and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. You see, even God struggled. If you just turn over back over the page and just go to 8 verse 5, um, oh, not over the page, back a couple, few pages. Even, even God was struggling with the Jews as, as, as to how their heart is. Why has this people, in 8 verse 5, why has this people turned away in perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to deceit, they refuse to return. Why is that? You know, the heart is a, it's a mystery. Rebellion is a mystery. Why rebellion emerged in heaven is a, is a mystery in of itself. Why it emerges in our heart is a mystery in of itself. And I remember when I was eight years old, and we liked to hang around with the lads, and we would always love to go down to the park, play ball, force them back, hockey, rugby, touch footy, whatever. But there was these grapes that were in this neighbour's house over there. And he would put along these stakes along there with the wire netting 
to stop people reaching over and pinching grapes. Of course, what do boys want to do? That's right, they want to what? Pinch grapes. And so what do we do? Pinch the grapes. And so with great deal of effort, we put our arms underneath and grab the grapes. And of course, then one day, this great big bald-headed man peers up over the fence there and we fall off the fence and onto the ground on our backs and go, oh, why did we do it? Were we hungry? Was Mark hungry? No. Did it because we just wanted to do it. That's the nature of rebellion. You know, Gold Coast on one of those theme parks. Oh, wet paint. Oh, it is. <laughs> I just couldn't help it, but I touched it. I had to touch it, and I ended up with, a, you know, why do we do it? Because the mystery of rebellion. And that is in the heart of all of us. And so, you know, even God was struggling in 8 verse 5 as to the mystery of rebellion, rhetorically, of of course. Um, But because God is holy, because he is uh, all-knowing, he is the one who is just and is able to uh, look into everyone's heart that I, the Lord, search all hearts, test the mind, and give every man according to his ways, according to his fruitful deeds. Has anyone got the New Living Translation here? Has anyone got the New Living Translation? Because or some of the other translations also use that God, I, the Lord, also search all secret motives as well. And motive is everything. It is the why we do things is critically important that reveals what's inside our heart. Now, so I've said to you this morning that that we of ourselves cannot formulate right beliefs, attitudes, and behaviours by ourselves. And we need to resist the notion, but I think I can. I think I can. I think I have enough wisdom that I can do that. And start cutting God down to that. Must resist that. What's the solution? He goes on to say, a couple of verses down here, Jeremiah. He gives a little bit of a hint of it here. Uh, And he says, um, verse 11, Like a partridge that gathers a, a brood that did not hatch... Oh, sorry, we'll go down to verse 14. Um, Time's starting to uh, get away from us. Verse 14, heal me, O Lord, and I what? Save me, and I... So where does healing come from? The only source of healing can come from God, not from these false ideas and false theologies that people will make up in order to match their own lifestyle and their own convenience. We have to let God be God. And why this is important here is that God is the one who can only heal. He is the only one who can transform He's the only one who can change the heart. And he's the only one who can save. Why is this important? And when we look at what it is like for Seventh-day Adventists living in the last day of Earth's history, they're going to be, and we kind of covered this in, in, in Sabbath school, and I preempted my sermon here, Bronwyn. I tried not to, but I couldn't resist it. <laughs> but, you, you know, when, when it comes to, when you look at something like the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins, there are those who were wise, those who were, who were foolish, but both are 
Adventus. So, what we tend to do is come up with little neat answers as to why they apostatize. Because they didn't have enough faith. Yes. They didn't pray enough. Okay. Is that helpful? It's too broad. You know, it's like Jesus is the answer to everything. You know, when you ask a question, the answer is Jesus. And, you know, you used to do this in Sabbath school and people say, John Ortberg had this little saying, he says, well, he remembers in Sunday school and he says, um, and the teacher asks, well, what is this? Well, it looks like a squirrel, but is the answer Jesus? Uh, yeah, and, you know, I've been in those Sabbath schools where those lessons where it's like that. And sometimes we can be a little bit like that and a little bit like that as to why they might leave. Well, the text doesn't quite say other than that they did not have enough oil. But there are certain processes that happen with people that allow them to leave that to go to that because both groups started with oil. Both of them started with the right beliefs, the right attitudes, the right behaviours, and, and they all slumbered and they all slept. But at the end of the day, half of them ended up leaving. Little by little, people make decisions and start cutting that cloth to suit their lifestyle, whatever that might be, and start sinking roots elsewhere. But I can handle it. But I'm okay. I'll give it up tomorrow, next week. I'll stop looking. I'll stop uh, reading. That. I, I will go back to your word tomorrow. But guess what? Tomorrow never comes. There is a saying, and there's a lot of truth, many will go to hell in a handbasket. The road to hell is paved with many good intentions. And unfortunately, there's a lot of truth in that. And I don't want to be negative. But we need to be aware, through the illumination of God's Holy Spirit, that we ensure that we are sinking our roots deep down into God's love. He is the one who can heal us. And Jeremiah emphatically says um, that you will be healed, that you will be saved. When we look to him, you will be healed. When we look to him, you will be saved. And that is terrific news, isn't it? And that is the nature of grace because like that shrub in the desert, Jesus himself ended up in the desert. He ended up experiencing that thirst because he was separated from the Father's love. But he did this in order that he would pay the penalty for our sin so that we would be treated as he deserves in heaven. He paid that penalty. And the good news is that when we look to him, he's able to transform, to heal, to save, and to give us that right attitudes, behaviours, and values. And through his Holy Spirit, he can shield us from the world that seeks to take us away from him. And look to him who is the author and the finisher of our faith.